Welcome to today's version of the Provost Conversations on Teaching. Uh, let, and let me start by thanking the Center for Learning and Teaching for organizing this series. For those of you who have not come for one of these uh, conversations before, please note that if you have a comment uh, or a question, could you raise your hand and ask for the mic because this entire session is being recorded and we'd like to have your question in the, on file in video because then somebody who actually missed this could actually see you and get words of wisdom from you as well. Uh, my major task today is to introduce Maura Hammetts. Now, I know that Dr. Hammetts doesn't need an introduction to most of you because there are a fair number of people from the history department who are here who know her as well as I do. Nevertheless, since there are some others, like Scott, for example, uh, let me say a few things uh, about Mora. Mora is going to talk about this fascinating topic, the past in the present tense. I know that she's written a couple of books and many, many articles. She's an expert on Italian fascism. She's taught courses on a variety of topics such as national identity, uh, European, uh, the, the Holocaust, uh, what else, Mora? 19th century. That's right, 19th and 20th century international history, and so on. But what she's trying to do today is something really ambitious. And that is to look at the past and see how the past illuminates the present. To see what we can learn from the past and how the past may be able to give us some directions into the future. Now this is a really ambitious task given that we, are, we have maybe 60 minutes or a little more. But if anybody can do it, Maura can. <laughs> and so I give you Dr. Maura Hammonds. Thank you very much. I actually, uh, when um, I was contacted about doing this, I kind of thought, oh, but what do I have to say? Because I've been to a number of these conversations and people tend to talk about all different kinds of things and I don't often think that carefully about exactly the process of teaching. And I think that's true for a lot of us. We do it every day or every other day and we don't really think of how, what it is that in the process of teaching that makes are teaching either um, relevant or interesting or not interesting some semesters better than others, right? <laughs> and so what I wanted to do when I really thought about it was to talk about why history is important and, why, and how I try to teach my students and have them understand that history is important and not just why they should study it for the past itself, but why it's important in the present. And so that was kind of how I got to this topic. And I realized yesterday, um, when I was actually really looking at the title again, and when it, realizing it's really set in stone because Allison so kindly asked me to make sure that my PowerPoint would work early in the week, um, that it sounds like either a grammar lesson or a writing lesson, and I, I, I want to apologize to anyone from the English department. I don't intend to do that. Um, or it actually could be interpreted as doing exactly what I tell my students not to do all the time, which is to think of the past as if it is the present, because it's not. Um, and I don't really intend to offer any kind of a riff on the commonplace that if we don't learn from history, we're doomed to repeat it. I don't think that that's particularly the case either. Rather, what I meant by the title was that I hope that we can have a conversation, and I do mean a conversation, about teaching history and bearing in mind its contemporary relevance and how we can convey that to students through the ways in which we actually approach the subject matter. Um, 
in, in a manner that makes the question, what's the use or importance of this, actually seem a kind of ridiculous question because it becomes central. My students don't have to ask me that because they know at every turn I'm actually going to give it to them or they're going to be able to draw that inference themselves. That's my aim, is to have them say immediately, oh, I see what's relevant in that. I see the parallel. I see the link. Um, and so I want to actually talk about how history and the humanities more broadly is not only relevant but really central to our education as a society and in our everyday life. And so there are two ways in which I'd like to address this relevance. One is in making history relevant to students and that's pedagogical tools or pedagogical approaches that I try to use to make my students think that or see that it's relevant. And the second one is really a broader question, and I, that is more, I just want to offer a few thoughts and then hopefully provoke the conversation um, to prove, to answer the critics and to say that humanities is central to education and we shouldn't even be having to defend it. That that, that should be at the basis of what we all do and we, there should be a basic understanding of that and how, how maybe we can get to that. So. First, I wanted to talk about the pedagogical tools and how I aim to do what we're all trying to do, which is really to capture students' attention, right? Um, first, and Chandra's lovely introduction actually took this away, but I'm a modern Europeanist. I'm trained in modern European history, 19th and 20th century, with an emphasis on fascism and Nazism, and um, I teach 19th and 20th century, and most of what I've published has actually dealt with um, Europe from about 1890 forward. Um, I think there are basically five pedagogical approaches that I take to try to capture students' attention and, and I think too their imagination because that's the only way I think that history can live past the semester that you have a student is if you not only capture their attention in class but their imagination as they're moving forward. And so I have five particular ways in which I try to engage them in the subject matter. And I actually didn't list them on this slide because um, I actually took the CLT's um, thing on how to do PowerPoint presentations. That's why there aren't a lot of words on here. It's a dark background. And also, I um, didn't list everything because I don't want you to be reading. I want you to be hearing and thinking about what I'm saying. So anyway, so you have to pay attention throughout. So thank you. See? All right. So. Um, at any rate, the first way that I really try to engage students is to refer to contemporary culture and life, to things that they are familiar with. Um, and that, for me, often use, I use images or other aspects of po popular culture that students are not necessarily going to um, associate with education, but allow them a way in. And in particular, in this case, I've chosen two films, both of which are not, well, one is very new, is Hunger Games is 2012, right? The other is A Bug's Life, which is 1998, which as most of us who are teaching know, might actually be outside of the scope of actually students' lives. And, but anyway, I still <laughs> have to use some of them. Um, and really, both of these films I use, um, actually, I used one today, but in a different way, but I use both of them to talk about in the 1920s and 30s totalitarianism and to show how it can be linked to various forms of government because when we think of totalitarianism we usually associate Nazism, fascism and communism in the interwar period and yet those are across the political spectrum. They're not the same political uh, ideology and yet we associate them with totalitarianism. So what do The Hunger Games and A Bug's Life have in common? is that they both illustrate these kinds of totalitarian governments and they give students a sense of, oh, I remember the ants. Um, in A Bug's Life is a story of ants who are trapped in a society where they're subservient to grasshoppers for whom they have to provide food each year. And the exchange, I'm gonna just sort of read you a quick exchange between the grasshoppers leader, Hopper, who is this really incredibly kind of nasty looking guy towering over 
these ants here. And um, Flick, who is an inventor who's invented a new threshing machine that's supposed to help them be able to feed people more easily and make food more easily so that they actually might have leisure time, which we all know is ooh bad in a totalitarian society. So what the leader of the Hopper says is, remember that ideas are very dangerous things. Your mindless, soil-shoving losers put on this earth to serve us, he says. And Flick says, you're wrong, Hopper. Ants are not meant to serve grasshoppers. I've seen these ants do great things, and year after year, they somehow manage to pick food for themselves and you. So, who is the weaker species? Ants don't serve grasshoppers. It is you who needs us. We are a lot stronger than you say we are, and you know it, don't you? And so, in this kind of exchange, and I actually play the clip for them, but I figured, you know, anyway, maybe I could keep your attention that long. Um, <laughs> they actually, students get this sense of the totalitarian nature of the social order, at the social order that's established, the idea of one group ruling over another, and yet the inherent tension between the two groups in a kind of a Marxist Marxist perspective, right? It's really a, it's a Marxist perspective of socioeconomic proletariat, bourgeoisie in a totalitarian framework. The Hunger Games offers what I would say is a fascist or Nazi, Nazi framework for totalitarianism in corporatism. And it's actually one of the best um, tools actually recently to help explain that because students have not a very clear idea of syndicalism or corporativism or how totalitarian economics is different from just repression or freedom of economic uh, and the idea of the ways in which the free market is organized in a, or participates in a totalitarian society. And so the Hunger Games, I think, actually offers a corporativist model, which is reminiscent of fascism and, Mar uh, and Nazism. If you, any of you know the story of, um, of the Hunger Games, it's about a society called Panem that is divided into districts. And you have the capital, and all of the other districts surrounding it are organized on a corporative model. Each district does a certain kind of social pro of production for the center. And as you go out, the districts actually um, become more and more distant from the center. They become poorer until you get to the very fringe and then you get off into the wilderness, which is actually not society. Uh, and it's arranged in that way. And that's actually how fascism is arranged in corp along a corporative model where you have all the shipbuilders, a district in Panem that's all maritime industries and fishing. That is the, that is a corporate entity in fascism. And it's run by all the shipbuilding leaders of shipbuilding firms, but in various ways they are doing their tribute to the center. And so it really offers a way to extend this idea of totalitarianism and show how the corporativist model, like the Marxist model, both can fit into this idea of totalitarianism, but the ways and means in which politics um, are done in both of those are very different. And so it helps students, I think, to try to look at this really big concept of totalitarianism, understand there are different things in it, and to break it down without having to really stretch too, too far and say in the abstract, you know, to if I were to give you the definition of totalitarianism, it, it doesn't have that kind of immediacy for students or relevance. They see, they can see it, they can understand it. So I always try to bring them into contemporary life. Here's another. This is actually a scene from Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows, 2010. And um, I'm not sure that anyone who does anything with popular culture can actually avoid Harry Potter unless you're trying to studiously avoid it. Um, Images of contemporary life or popular culture reveal the immediacy here of historical images through direct reference to them. When children are watching Harry Potter most of the time, I don't think they recognize the direct references to Nazism, but they're there. They're all over. If you look at um, the scene, which is actually the Ministry of Magic, 
Um, Harry Potter is, is a direct reference to resistance against Nazism. Um, he is undesirable number one on these huge posters of undesirable number one that come and cover the screen. The Nazis are famous for their imagery, for actually bringing art as propaganda, for bringing those kinds of posters and bringing those images to the public. If you think of Lenny Riefenstahl and the triumph of the will and the way in which posters and banners are all symbolic. Um, Harry Potter is very, if you think of the banners and the ways in which these images show, it's, it's direct. It's a direct hit. And, and I, what I did was I put up here two specific things that I wanted you to notice. And it's a little hard to see, but if you notice, you can see the soldiers here in the pictures. Here's one, here's another. The, first of all, the people are dressed in a, in a way that looks like World War II. You know, if you think about the way they're dressed, it really does have certain reminiscences to the 1940s. But also, these images, these um, uniforms, if you can see them, are actually these sort of Nazi uniforms, and you can actually see they have a red band on them um, around their armband, which would, doesn't have a swastika on it, but still, it conjures this image of evil, but it's a direct um, response to Nazism. And when you have the people who are chasing Harry Potter through the scene, if you've ever seen this movie, the leaders of the ministry are wearing these long black leather coats that come to their, to their legs. I mean, that's, it's a clear Nazi image. Um, it is throughout. The monumental architecture in the center, the statue here is of wizards on the top crushing muggles here who are regular people. Um, who, and it, who are oppressing them. It's an image that really brings up sort of ideas of racial purity. Um, it's a directly relevant um, look at it. And just to sort of give you the further um, imagery here, magic is might. If you look at that, it looks kind of like the um, eagle with the sun radiating, radiating from it that is often a symbol of Nazism coming out of the top of architecture from the period. Magic is might and Arbeit macht frei. Work makes you free. That's the gate to one of the um, concentration camps. So you're using these kinds of imagery, propaganda in a directly Nazi line. I mean, it's directly reminiscent of it. Um, and so I wanted to bring that out because this is an actual direct reference and a way that we look at it, it can really bring alive Nazism, totalitarian, uh, Nazism in particular, and the ways in which the Nazis appealed to people, the ways in which they oppressed people, and the ways in which resistance came about, if you actually look at the way it's done in Harry Potter. And most students have some glancing idea about Harry Potter, right? It can also be done in a much less um, uh, direct way, um, but doing the same thing. Nazis really for, um, teaching Nazism is pretty, is relatively easy because it's such a powerful image. And it's an image that we see every day even if we don't know that we're seeing it. It can be very indirect as well. Um, and that's one of the reasons I use The Lion King. Most of the students have an idea of The Lion King, although now some of them it was 1994. Um, so again, we're getting back there now. I'm going to have to come up with some new ones. But um, clearly here, Scar, who is the bad lion, is standing at, atop a, he's actually in a termite hill, but he's standing atop a termite hill. He's overlooking the hyenas who owe their allegiance to him as they march forward and goose step forward in front of him. And you see this in a sort of monumental scene of Scar overlooking them and this parade. Now, children who are watching this, we don't think of as associating this with Nazism, but the parents who are watching it and people who are educated watching it can only see it on some level as Nazi evil. Goose step, the goose step is specific to Nazism. We don't think of the hyena as did it as, as Nazi, but if you look at it this way, it is a direct reference to this conception of evil that history gives us. 
History has handed us a conception of evil that we define in terms of Nazism that shows up in our life everywhere and, and in the way we interpret or encode things. And so trying to hook into how students do that is one of the things that I try to do with these images, directly, indirectly. Um, the other thing here is the monumental architecture, the idea of uh, being atop with the monuments, um, straight, no uh, little adornment. Um, and it's a sort of prime example of fascist architecture. And if you look at the lines, you can see the similarity of the lines of what SCAR stands on and the monumental architecture. And so it's a way of getting students into the visual culture, to look at the visual culture of the Nazi period, to look at the remnants of it, and to look at the way it really has an impact on our popular culture in our life today, every, without even them knowing it from when they're very young until they're in the classroom. So that's a way of capturing their attention and also making it relative, re relevant. I also try to offer them real life examples. And I know you can't read this, so don't worry, I, I'm not gonna ask you to. Um, but one of the things that I think is hard in history, particularly with students who are wondering about its relevance is to, to explain not only that history is living and when what it means that history is living and how history is created and continues to be created and is changed every day. Our perspective on it changes. And what I've done actually to try to get this point across and, and some others as well is to use definitions from Wikipedia and I know that Wikipedia is something that a lot of people scorn kind of immediately, but I have my students use it all the time. It's an honest admission that they're going to use it all the time. It's an honest admission that I use it all the time. When I want to look up the date that somebody was born or died or came to power, I'm going to use Wikipedia because it's easy and 99.9% .9 of the time that information on it is going to be correct right, the information that I want to get from it. But what I think is really interesting and what students can take out of this and what makes it relevant um, is telling them how history changes and how perceptions of history change and how our own perceptions of the moment change in history and change what we record as history. And one of the things that I use is the Wikipedia definition of fascism. It also helps me to build a historiography or a history of history. And I just want to read you um, a small part of this um, definition, uh, and you'll see what I mean. This is from January 11, 2011. Fascism is a radical and authoritarian nationalist political ideology. Fascists seek to organize a nation according to corporative perspectives, values, and systems, including the political system and economy. Fascism was originally founded by Italian national syndicalists in World War I who combined extreme Sorelian syndicalist political views along with nationalism. Though normally described as being on the far right, there is a scholarly consensus that fascism was also influenced by the left but with a focus on solutions from the right. You can see here the sort of attempt to balance this idea of left and right that fascism is not really of the right. And it has a lot to do, if you remember back to January 2011, political discourse that is trying to paint Obama as a, as a fascist. And so there's a lot in the news about Obama being a fascist or about um, Democrats being fascist. Or, and this actually affects the definition here. It affects the definition and it changes over time. And what I do with my students is I actually started this in 2008. And I have the definition of fascism that I use with them starting in 2008, moving to 2009 to 2011. Um, I missed 2010. I was on sabbatical in January and I didn't get it. Um, but also here you notice that, um, and I'll go to the 2012 definition in a second, but I wanted to do a little bit more with the 2011, which is, Fascists believe that the nation is an organic community, requires strong leadership, singular collective identity, and the will and ability to commit violence and wage war. 
um, collective national society. They aim, they, and fascism rejects the concepts of egalitarianism, materialism, and rationalism in favor of action, discipline, hierarchy, spirit, and will. Um, fascism perceives conservatism as partly valuable for its support of order in society, but disagrees with its typical opposition to change and modernization. It presents itself as a solution to the perceived benefits and disadvantages of conservatism by advocating state-controlled modernization that promotes orderly change while resisting the dangers to order of, in society of pluralism and independent initiative. This doesn't sound like something in the 1930s. This is a definition that reflects ideas about politics and what government intervention does in 2011. Fascists themselves would never have defined this this way. And what I do to balance this is to give them Gentile's philosophies of fascism, in which he defines the corporative state, in which he defines economic relations based on an absolute um, abhorrence of the left. And all of these kinds of ideas of promoting, of um, socialism of the left, and also ways in which um, they court the right and actually bring it into fascism as a part of fascism. This is a very, an, an attempt to balance that actually is, was never there in the 1930s but reflects 2011. And it's in Wikipedia, which they all read, right? Here's the 2012 definition, November 2012, which I took it yesterday actually. And it's interesting because it has changed significantly, and it's only a year. And so if students are looking at definitions and trying to define con uh, concepts, big concepts, what I think this brings out is that they change and that we are always writing history as it's happening and rewriting the past. And it helps them to understand ideas about revisionism because it's always a bad word that historians are now revisionists, that um, we ignore the old and we're always trying to rewrite it. Well, history has always been rewritten and it's being rewritten re to reflect the politics of today, to see what we see today. Here, it's a form of radical authoritarian nationalism. They seek to unify their nation based on super personal connections of ancestry and culture. It's, it's a tremendous change from January 2011. Through a totalitarian state that seeks mass mobilization of the national community through discipline, indoctrination, physical training, and economic corporativism. Fascism utilizes a vanguard party to initiate a revolution to organize the nation on fascist principles. The fascist party in state is led by a supreme leader who exercises dictatorship over the party, the government, and other institutions. Fascism views direct action, including political violence and war, as a means to achieve national rejuvenation, spirit, and vitality. How have our political views changed since, Nova, since January 2011? And the emphasis on different kinds of nationalism, on war, on violence, on where we are in war and violence, our ideas of patriotism, and it really is reflected in the change in the definition of fascism on Wikipedia, which is kind of a fascinating thing if you think about it. And I would bet that anything that you teach, if you trace the Wikipedia definition, if it's something contentious, obviously it's got to be something contentious that people are constantly wanting to rewrite. But if you do that, um, and students find this supremely interesting because they never thought about it before in most cases, that historiography is written. How is historiography written? Well, if I take, and then I have them take 2008, 2009, 2010, and 2011, and look at the, or there are four of them, how, look at how the different definitions and put together a definition. That's the historiographical consensus of today. And so it gives students a way to refer to modern technology to modern ways in which we convey information. It makes it relevant to today because obviously we talk about how this reflects current day politics on a concept that's very complicated and to see how it changes over time. What time does to that with respect to what 
it was described as in the 1930s or seen or experienced as. Um, and you'll see why this is actually even more relevant in terms of where I hope we can go with sort of arts and humanities and history. So this is another way of making history relevant to students or at least catching their attention because once you actually put up something from Wikipedia on the screen, a lot of them actually close their own laptop and say, wait a minute, my professor said that you can't use Wikipedia and starts with that. So, all right. There are other ways to just more, and this is a kind of more conventional way, I think, um, that everyone might think of, but I think it bears um, repeating, is to draw links to contemporary politics, society, or issues. And you can do it through images, you can do it through maps, you can do it through something that's going to capture their attention. This, in particular, is um, an allegory of the inauguration of the Suez Canal. And one of the things that I think I use it for for students is to draw, and I actually didn't use it this year, my students who are here, um, is to draw attention to the European involvement and the European perspective on the Suez Canal. I mean, the Ottomans barely appear here, and they're certainly not central, right? They're kind of meeting all these European leaders. In, and in fact, it's being built and inaugurated on their territory. And it speaks volumes about imperialism, about the ways in which over the centuries we've looked at the Middle East as foreign and as just dominated by European interests in which European interests are, are superior and are the most important. Um, not only does it show that, it, it demonstrates this sort of European idea or treatment of subjugation of subjects um, within the empire within the Ottoman Empire. Also, vague allusions to the cradle of civilization in Greece and Rome, so that the Europeans sort of re-overtaking the Mediterranean, taking the link from the Mediterranean to the Red Sea, reasserting their influence over all of this area in a way that helps students to recognize that the interconnectedness of European um, history, European relationships to the Middle East of the 19th century and then up into the 20th century. The allegory treats subject or primitive peoples um, in a way that um, allows me to actually draw parallels or links to the ways in which we view the, the Muslim world today, right? Radical Muslims sort of out on the fringes doing all kinds of wild bacchanalia things here. Um, and it's, not an, it's an image that's based in an old conception that as we look over history, we can see actually how it's developed. It's not really just about oil. It's about resources, it's about power, it's about influence. And, if we, and solving the oil problem is not gonna end this issue in the Middle East. It wasn't really about that. Opening up the Suez Canal was about trade, it was about power and influence, and it was about markets. And none of that's really eliminated by some of the very syncretic issues that we tend to touch on in the present. So it also, particularly last year, helped me, and I didn't actually do it again this year, we did some other things, but to look at the Arab Spring when that was happening and those notions of democracy and why they tend to fail. Why, did the, why is the Arab Spring eclipsed? And it's because if you look at the way in which the Europeans treated the Ottomans, what they expected from the Ottomans, you can really draw that link to what the West expects of the Egyptians or how they think democracy is going to be imported. There's, it's not understood or imported the same way. It's not better or it's not worse, but it's not, it's not compatible. And it helps them to, to draw these links and to think about ways in which the history of it is actually relevant and central. Finally, one of the things that this really allowed me to do is to bring in religious elements that I think we do really fundamentally forget about sometimes when we look at the Near East, even though we're talking about the Israel versus Palestine versus the Arab world, we really forget that it is on some level based on fundamental differences in faith and fundamental differences in the way we respect certain faiths or don't respect certain faiths and the way in which Europeans have treated non-Christian faith 
for centuries. Um, the Crimean War, before the building of the, the Suez, uh, be, before, before the building of the canal, is actually sparked by, uh, and we talk about this, um, a question of whether France can actually really protect holy places in the Near East. Well, what is our interest today? Often it is about protecting those holy places, protecting those holy lands, and the ways in which we see those holy lands being protected today. Um, and so it allows us to, to discuss those issues and bring up the real, the fundamental importance of faith in looking at history and how that moves over time. So another way is to draw parallels to current events or current society. And um, I actually talked to my class a little bit about this today, although um, they haven't quite done this yet and we didn't quite get here. But um, the two images on the left are, um, most of you probably recognize Mary Poppins, right? <laughs> Disney version of Mary Poppins. The top one is the Fidelity Fiduciary Bank where they're telling Michael and um, his sister how to spend their tuppence. The bottom one is Mary Poppins telling them, Michael and Jane, how to spend their tuppence. The top one is to invest your tuppence wisely in the bank. And they'll grow and they'll be calm. And I wrote them down because I knew I wouldn't. Railways through Africa, dams across the Nile, and self-amortizing canals. That's what you're going to get out of investing your tuppence wisely in the bank. And it'll grow to a tremendous amount. That's what Mr. Banks, the father, is saying. He's a representative of classical liberalism, the classical liberal view of why you would invest from the top. It's, it, it, it's a direct parallel to ide conservative ideas of economic growth and investment and spurring investment through, um, through investment through the top. Mary Poppins, on the other hand, really does symbolize two different other perspectives. One is socialism, clearly she's a socialist, and her idea about give your tuppence, feed the birds. You should, the birds have to eat. Their young ones are hungry, their nests are bare. And all you have to do is give a few tuppence, give a little bit of your taxes to help those people and give them entitlement programs and everybody will be better off and the young ones will not be hungry. The other part of it that's really very interesting is the idea of charity because she talks about it in front of St. Paul's with the saints and the apostles looking down and they're gonna smile. So it's the idea really that is captured by Occupy Wall Street right this idea that it's it's chari that unmitigated greed and unregulated commerce makes people not only is it bad for society but makes people inhuman and by drawing that parallel to the, of the of the ways in which the political spectrum was viewed in England and is pr actually given um, pretty openly in Mary Poppins. Um, students actually can listen to those songs and think about them, and I know that they're thinking about them in their head when they write their answers down to questions about, you know, liberalism, socialism, Christian charity, and ideas about the ways in which the economy functions. It's directly relevant. And it also shows how these ideas are not new. Somehow we seem to think of trickle-down eco economics as beginning with Reagan often. And we put it on our political spectrum that way. And in fact, this suggests that it's been going on a lot longer and that imperialism is linked to it. And our relation shows how our relationships around the world can be drawn into it and not only to occupy Wall Street. So, those are um, the final way, really, that I try to get students to think about the relevance is to draw on universal understandings. And there, there are a couple of universal understandings or things that I think that they can 
relate to that um, really have helped me, I think, to draw students in on various times. One is, um, and I'm just going to read you a little bit of the description, Marx of Engels' description of the River Irk in Manchester in 1844 when he was describing the condition of the English working class. And he said, it is a narrow, coal black, stinking river of filth and rubbish which it deposits on a more low-lying right bank. In dry weather, this bank represents a spectacle of a series of the most revolting blackish-green puddles of slime from the depths of which bubbles the miasmatic gases constantly rise and create a stench that is unbearable even to those standing on the bridge 40 or 50 feet above the level of water. Moreover, the flow of the river is continually interrupted by numerous high wares behind which quantities of slime and refuse collect and putrefy. That one short passage links the, the ideas of what's happening in the early Industrial Revolution to all kinds of um, movements today, from the Green Movement to um, the ways in which we try to address the industrial, uh, industrial poor. And, and it's, but it's a, an image that we all can understand. It's, an Im it's a kind of universal image of pollution and um, of poverty, of industrialization that isn't so different from things that we would describe today, that isn't so different from scenes that we would describe today that we would be trying to address today. And so it gives a sense of the universal. Another thing, and it's kind of a trick, and it's different from climate issues and poverty industrialization because it's actually positive, is that we think about what we all share. And one of the things, I've done quite a bit of research on names or animosity, and one of the things we all share is names. And one of the ways to bring students into a discussion often is to get them to think about names. Because if you ask them about their names, or about the names of, of their ancestors, or they'll comment on the name, you know, what is Maximilian doing in Mexico? Well, the Austrian emperor went to Mexico in the 1850s, so that's why there are, Mex there are, there are Austrian names in, in Mexico. <coughs> and so if you can tap into something like that, that students really experience and take and hold as sacred, we hold our names as sacred, as something that is immediate and of importance to us. Um, what those names mean historically doesn't have to be directly shown to them, but they can make those broader connections and distinctions and it actually brings students in to listen and to think about what you're saying in a more global way. And so the five things that I really use and here see and I did listen to CLT because I now I have it for you right um, to capture students attention are the to refer to, con to contemporary culture and life to offer current real life examples to draw links to contemporary society politics or issues draw parallels to current events in society or to draw on universal understandings and themes. That brings me to the second part which actually is a very where I really hope we can have more of a discussion and I'll just sort of introduce what I wanted to say and that is to answering the critics of the humanities. Um, and I, I guess actually I'm not sure why humanities is on the defensive. We are academia, and defending what we do puts us at a level that I think puts us on the wrong side. Um, I've, used, I've outlined today several ways I, in which I use the past each day, and how I can point to the relevance and even centrality of historical events to today's world. And I would say, in how many fields can researchers actually say exactly what they study will be directly relevant to scholars' work in a hundred years? If you are teaching engineering, what you're teaching in your engineering class is unlikely to be directly relevant to what your students are learning in a hundred years. It will be far surpassed, or progress will have overcome it. I'm sorry if anybody's an engineer. Um, many professional degrees so prized for their currency are just that, they're current. And, and their subject matter and research will be forgotten and surpassed by the next generation. 
history and the humanities are not ephemeral. Too often humanities, including history, adopts a me too approach to sort of justify itself. That it says, ah, um, and it's something that was labeled this me too in a piece in Inside Higher Ed in January 2012 by David Brooks, and it's kind of called a revisionist strategy. I can teach you to use and understand technology. I, can, I too have kept up with the modern world. But keeping up with the modern world requires knowing what the modern world is. And you can't know that without the context of the humanities. You don't know it through engineering. You, you know it through, and I'm just picking on engineering because it's one of the easiest to use. Um, the defen you, you can't know where you are unless you know wh where you've been. And you can't possibly hope to progress unless you know what your aims are. And your aims are based on your understanding of society and society's needs. And that's what the humanities and history give you. Um, so it's more a call to work together. It's not a call to denigrate anyone. Too often, and then the other aspect is a kind of general understanding approach. I can teach you critical thinking that will serve you through your, out your life. True, but we fail to show how this works or why this is relevant, or why in someone's professional life this is actually the most important thing that they're going to use. That once you are working in a corporation using your business degree for 10 years, you're hopefully going to go on to management. And you're not any longer going to be using those skills that you learned in, in your basic accounting course. You're not going to be using them. You're going to be managing the people who use them to do the accounts and accounting. And that's what humanities is going to allow you to do. At worst, at least from my perspective, is this kind of veiled um, approach that sometimes we do adopt, which is it's good for you. The sort of traditionalist approach is we've always done it. It's good for you, and you need to do it. And it comes off as kind of elitist. And I think very often that in being defensive, historians and people in the humanities just adopt that. Well, that's not useful, and the, the, and the first thing people are going to do is run over and say, well, pff, goodbye, you know, um, you're an elitist, you're in the ivory tower. Um, and actually, there's also a political side to this, which is the idea that the failure to teach humanities in the way that certain people think it should be taught w betrays the responsibility to honor the great monuments of culture. That's actually something that somebody said at a Stanford conference on the humanities recently. I would like to say that humanities and history um, really are central. And what they're central to is to actually the human condition and to progress. And that's um, where I kind of want to end, is that if you don't understand the, the humanities and history, you can't even understand what progress is. And if you can't understand what progress is, and you can't understand where the future is going based on the needs of the human condition and the history of the human condition, then you have no hope of going forward through progress. The Nazis claimed that they were moving forward through progress. Stalinism claimed that it was progress. I hardly think that we measure those as progressive today. And without the study of history and humanities, we're abandoned to vague notions of progress that have no basis in the human condition. So I'm happy to take any questions or anything. Uh-oh. Maura, if we reverse your title, and talk about the present in the past, mm -hmm. wouldn't that be a justification for knowing the past? Because, and, and we are, we are talking yeah. then about this whole question of the present and what it role it plays in the present, because obviously your contention is our understanding of the past is, is really important for the present. Mm -hmm. And you rightly pointed out that our understanding of the past is colored by the present. 
Right. And and that is one of the crucial things that you seem to be teaching in your history courses. I just want you to reflect on that a little bit. It, it definitely. We want to see what we're doing as relevant. But I, I think in teaching we often get so caught up in what the content is that we need to get across or what the idea is in the past that fascinated us in the first place that we forget that something spurred us to look at it in the first place. Something in the present spurred us to want to go and find it in the past. And I think one of the, for me, one of the things about teaching is that looking at what spurred you to go into the past or the historiography or the history of history is the only way to get students and even me to think about why is it that I'm interested in this? What is it that pulls me to it? What is it about, I mean, when I started to study Trieste, which is the city that, um, for those of you who don't know, is a city in which my, most of my work is central, is concentrated on, why did Trieste pull my attention? It was nowhere, nobody even knew about it. Um, it was on the periphery of, of Italy, it was on the edge of the Cold War curtain, and everybody basically even said to me, you're never going to get a job and no one's ever going to care about Trieste. Well, last week, Trieste was in the New York Times as one of the most important places in Europe to visit. And it's been, it's enjoyed this huge resurgence. Well, what was it 20 years ago now, God, that's, that got me interested in it? What was it? Well, it took me a long time to realize it was my background. It was the fact of, that I have a very diverse, mixed background from, partially from that area of the world, partially from the Balkans, a mixture of sort of Central Europe in my background, and also then having spent time in Finland and then in Yugoslavia questioning those ideas of the Cold War that actually created places like Trieste and what was underneath that. And so, I think it, it's very personal, but I think that also we all tend to live th and to, you know, to understand through the personal. And I think that that's what I mean by relevance, too, and, and teaching. What else? I, I have a question. Um, I was thinking about what you were talking about when you were saying that um, we want to think about what children are learning and the children are learning a bug's life and so they have this concept of this you know totalitarian leader cartoons do this before children are even cognizant that they're getting things i'm, I'm a linguist so i i think in terms of you know i'm from new york the bad guys are always from new york you know and so children come to our classes with these preconceived things that were put into them when they couldn't even barely speak Right, well, and Nazis are evil, right? There's a lot of other evil, right? Um, and I think it really also hopefully will spur us to take a look at public education. Um, one of the things that actually honestly drove me crazy this year, my son came home and he's in fourth grade and the Virginia curriculum no longer has the British bringing slaves to the new world. You know, it wasn't the British, right? Who brought the slaves to Jamestown? It wasn't the British. It was the Portuguese. <laughs> Portuguese sailors. Why was it Portuguese? And I actually posed this question in my class. Like, why the Portuguese? And they actually, I didn't even have, they've been sitting through my class long enough. They already knew the answer. Or somebody came up with it, right? What was it? Portuguese sailors on Dutch boats. Portuguese sailors on Dutch boats, but it's not the British, mind they were contracted you. Contracted by the British. Right, but why was why don't we want to say in Virginia it's the British? We like the British. <laughs> we like the British. They're our allies. We don't want to blame them. Let's board, who's going to claim? You know who's going to stand up for the Portuguese? So. And so what I hope that my students will do is actually start to think about these kinds of things based on the kinds of things that we talk about. Look around you, look at how history is constructed, 
how you learn what you learn and, and question those things based on what's happening at the moment. So it's, it's all around. I mean, Hunger Games, my kids now understand corporate, my children, I was, I, when that came out, I said, oh my gosh, corporative economics. I've been trying to teach this forever. It's making me think, for example, when I go over that section of modern architecture, how challenging it is to convey to the students that, you know, the government that, the communist influence government that builds the Casa del Popolo in Como is related to the centralized government that builds EUR, but also restores uh, the Arapacus and, mm -hmm. and uh, the Colosseum and, you know, other major monuments. And so there is a, a mixed legacy, let's say, that is um, hard to reconcile if you only vilify um, the term and what it stands for, I guess. Yeah. yeah. I wonder about the um, topics that we can't really understand from the past. Uh, now, I suppose by definition, we don't even know what they are. <laughs> but you get glimpses of them when you study the past. There are things out there that have no connection to today, uh, totally different conceptions and attitudes and behaviors and things that we really, really struggle to understand. The new historians coming into the department have a very different theoretical basis for their study of history than we did. Whereas people of sort of Austin, your generation, my generation, Jane Merritt, we looked at borders. We looked at um, sort of territorial mixing and borders and mixing of peoples and these sort of cultural approaches now have given way to environmental approaches or to different ways to um, conceptions of space where it used to be conceptions of language. Now historians are emphasizing conceptions of space. And so we move on. But what that means is that those things that have long been buried sometimes take on a new meaning and that's what historians are constantly doing. That's why going over the same source when you start at the beginning of your career and like now if I read it again, it's not just that I'm familiar with it, it's that I will see something new in it because history has changed since then. I use a book in my Nazism course called How Green Were the Nazis? And on the face of it, students kind of jump back and say, what do you mean, how green were the Nazis? The green movement in Germany is, if they know what the green movement in Germany is, but you know, the green movement in Germany is the left of the left, and here you are talking about the Nazis being green. Well, it depends on what aspects of greenness and environment you're looking at. They were, there was all kinds of Nazi legislation to protect the forest to preserve ancient German lands, to conserve German culture, to conserve um, German blood that actually have resonances in the way in which we try to save the owl today because it's a species that's representative of the diversity of the Americas and, and some of those ideas are actually from Nazi purity legislation which you know, and, and I'm not trying to make light of that, obviously, but it's not a way that 20 years we could even think of it because it was so immediate and um, it, it, we couldn't actually put it into that context. So I, I think there's always that. We always look back from where we are and see different things. And that's why whenever you throw something out, you know, a, a document or something, oh, this is useless. Well, it's only useless if you're looking at the questions you're asking of it today. It might not be useless in questions that we need to ask of it in the future. So, uh, yeah. Um, but thank you all for coming, and I hope it's something to think about.